we all working? Uh, herzlich willkommen. Um, ich bin hier mit uh, CK Stead um, und wir werden weiter auf Englisch gehen. Aber ich wollte nur sagen, dass heute in Deutschland ist um, sein Buch Mein Name war Judas gerade heute erschienen bei Eichborn. Um, das ist eine, eine provokative, revisionistische Darstellung von, um, uh, von der Geschichte von Jesus und, und Judas natürlich, uh, gesehen von der Standpunkt von Judas. Und, um, aber heute, today we're going to talk about his latest novel, Risk, which is um, something quite different, um, uh, which appears in England with us next week. Um, there was an English journalist, Peter Porter, who once wrote about Karl that um, whether he's in writing about Auckland, Oxford, Dubrovnik or Heraklion, he writes with absolute confidence. And um, with risk, he's turned to London um, on the, the, to the turbulent first decade of, of, of this um, millennium. Uh, in English, it's known as the noughties, um, which brought so much sort of financial and political um, sort of turbulence. Um, so, Carl, do you want to tell us a little bit about how you, where you've set, how you've set the atmosphere of, um, of the novel? Yes, well, this is um, a change from my last two, Mansfield and My Name Was Judas, and back more to the kind of novel I wrote earlier, a novel set in, in modern times and um, situations. But uh, not in New Zealand. It all happens in mostly in London, but otherwise in Europe and North America. And uh, I suppose what I was trying to do was to give a picture of the first decade of the first decade of the 21st century. Um, the central character is a New Zealander because I don't wouldn't have felt total confidence if he'd been an Englishman. If somebody had said, "Well, you hadn't got the nuances right." I wouldn't have been able to argue with that, but I feel with a New Zealander uh, in this situation, I, it's close enough to my own experience, although this is a younger man, uh, for me to, to have confidence. Um, so what I, well, if I can just describe his, his the central character is called Sam Nola. Um, you get some retrospective narrative. So you learn that in his younger days, in his early 20s, he had his, his Kiwi OE in London, and, and then he's gone back to New Zealand. He's married, he's had two children, he's had a fairly conventional life back in New Zealand, and then everything in his personal life has collapsed in the sense that he's had a divorce. And so he's decided to come back to London... And among other things, he discovers that in that early OE, he fathered a daughter with a, that he didn't know about, with a French uh, woman. And so she is another character in the novel, is this French daughter that he hasn't previously known about. But he's, he's first of all, I mean, the novel, the name Risk applies in all kinds of ways, including financial. But uh, he, for him, it's a risk he's taking to go back Uh, to try and live in London, and he has been a commercial lawyer, and he gets a job in uh, a, an, a bank which I've invented called Interbank America in Canary Wharf. And so through his eyes, you see uh, the dramatic events of those first few years of... It, I suppose the novel covers five or six years... Uh, of the 21st century. It begins just after 9-11, and then it goes into the period of the build-up and argument about uh, the, the Iraq war and whether there should be one, and what he calls the 9-11 effect, which is the kind of split uh, among Labour supporters between those who go with... Ty ty uh, who accept Tony Blair's feeling that Britain has to go follow America into the Iraq war and those who oppose it. So that's all part of the background, but at the same time he's working in a bank and there is a slow recognition. It's a slow recognition for him and even slower for the people he's working for that uh, some kind of... something's going wrong, some kind of collapse is going to occur And it does occur towards the end of the novel, and it affects him as well. 
The other thing about him is that, uh, like quite a lot of New Zealanders, he has Croatian forebears. His name is Nola, and uh, he is his boss in the bank sends him to a banking conference in Croatia, but he has already had a visit to Croatia, uh, and he has connections there, and that, that becomes part of the story as well. Um, that's, that's a general picture. Should, should, should I wait for another no, question? No, I, I, well, I mean, we, I, the other thing I, I love about the book is the, um, is the way, you know, the, everything that's going on in the world is, is quite often seen through the, the prism of dinner party chat. And, um, uh, you know, he has a broad group of friends, and a lot of these friends are completely falling out over, over Iraq and what their views are on it. But I think, I mean, one scene which I think is absolutely brilliant in the novel is a, is a scene where... Um, Alistair Cameron and, Dave, and Tony Blair are on an aeroplane. So suddenly you, you get the, the impression that there are figures at work that are causing some of these world events to happen. Um, and it's actually very funny. I mean, it shouldn't be funny because they're yeah. discussing the death of, of the weapons inspector, David Kelly. But it's just a brilliant sort of vignette um, into, into that. I mean, the other question I, I wanted to ask was whether, um, you know, in this particular book, in the short space of 220 pages or so, the, the folly of the war in Iraq and the financial crash are very interconnected because they happen at the same time. Um, but do you find that there is... I mean, it's almost possibly impossible to think of that there is a, a direct connection between the two, but um, how, did that, how was that in your mind as you were, as you were writing? Well, not, not in the sense that I'm in any sense a, um, an expert on banking or commercial law or, or anything of that kind. I mean, I just have a general... Uh, person's, uh, you know, politically aware person's yeah. feeling that uh, it, it would be naive to say there couldn't be any connection between the huge and unnecessary financial waste and expenditure of the Iraq war and yeah. the banking collapse. There must be... doesn't mean that the banking collapse wouldn't have happened without it, but, no. I mean, I see them as connected. Yeah. But I don't say they're connected in the novel. The novel is not expository. It really just gives you a picture of these things happening. Yeah. Now and then, it did involve little technical things where I had to be sure that um, it was possible and, um, and there was someone I could ask on yeah. those technical yeah. questions. But um, the... Well... I'll, I'll stop at that. Yeah, point. I mean that's it struck me very much about your your writing and also reading uh, Mansfield, which is a novel um, on the life of Catherine Mansfield. Carl is an expert on Catherine Mansfield and was also the editor of her collected letters and diaries. So I suppose that gave you an off, you know that gave you a real insight into how I mean it's seen from a you know woman's point of view with with absolute. Um, I mean, it's so convincing. And here again, as you say, Sam Noda is a younger man. He's also a banker. And, um, you know, I'm fairly sure you've never worked in a bank. But, you, yeah. you know, well, I at least was convinced. But I'm not a banker myself. But I thought that was really, um, really brilliantly done. Now, Sam, um, we've been hearing a lot about, particularly from Bill Manhire, perhaps in the, in the sort of the opening speech about the New Zealand modesty and, um, you know, certain characteristics which are particular to, um, to New Zealanders. Sam is really likable. I mean, he's a likable banker. He's slightly naive. He's not a driver. He's the kind of character that things happen to. So his first marriage splits up and he thinks, well, is it because of pride? Maybe I'm not brave enough to go back. It's all a bit sort of indeterminate. Um, uh, is that, I mean, is that, was it conscious that you wanted to have a sort of the good side of a banker, that the, the bankers are not all kind of ghastly people, um, but they, they perhaps drift into something and then it goes a bit further... Well, first of all, he's, he's, not, he's not a banker to begin with. He's a lawyer, yeah. but he's a commercial lawyer. Um, but as for his character, um, he, as you say, he's, he's, uh, it was fairly important to me that he, he should be a person to whom things happen. As you say, he's not a driver. Um, so he's a rather neutral character drifting through... Um, uh, uh, rather sensitively, he's in a rather sensitive state. You know, yeah. his his marriage has collapsed. He's taken the risk of coming, and so he's, he's just found a everything. daughter, which is yeah. also and he's found a daughter. Locked him sideways. Yeah, yeah. and uh, and so he, he is. You are seeing what he sees, and he is, m m I suppose, more alert and observant than perhaps 
other people who are just carrying on with their lives around him, yeah. their Londoners being Londoners mostly, um, he, he is... Uh, the fact that he is a somewhat neutral character um, makes it possible for me to reveal stuff through him. Mm. Mm -hmm. But you were saying earlier, you had a, a quote from, um, from Alistair Campbell, I think, was it? Um, was it Alistair Campbell? You were saying that, that um, of that kind of... Uh, that driftability, you were talking about people who were, um, you know, who would end up in these sort of professions and that the whole, the whole kind of, uh, the criminal aspect of banking was kind of shift, you know, sort of something that just drifted and shifted. Um, but um, anyway, but the other thing that oh, I Oh, no, I think it was, um, it was a qu quotation from Peter Mandelson. Oh, Peter Mandelson, yeah. Mandelson. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So... Uh, oh, well, um, actually, I've, if I can... I should be more organised. I, I might be able to, to pull it out. Um, no, I won't fiddle okay, about no, for we'll, it. We'll leave it for the moment. But, I mean, what he was saying... Peter Mandelson, of course, got into big trouble and eventually lost his cabinet post. And what, what he was saying in this quotation was, which is from a, a memoir, uh, was, well, no, I, I wasn't greedy, but, you know, I, I wanted money because mm. I never had it. And... Uh, it came my way, and I cut corners. Yeah. And, which and is a big theme in the, in the book as well, because yeah. they, they have... Uh, well, do you want to explain what happens with this sort of wind, the shortfall, the shorting, um, the windfall that comes their way? You mean the money... And, and the decision the, to whether to access the money that... Ah, yes, well, when he, he goes... To, he's sent to Croatia to a banking conference there... And his, his boss says, you know, I can't spend a whole week, but I'll be coming. And um, I'll, I want you to meet my friend and colleague, Andre Krasner-Hawkeye, who uh, they shorten as they call, he comes, he's a Hungarian, they call him Hawkeye from Hungary, because uh, he's got this difficult name, Andre Krasner-Hawkeye. Um, and then the boss is killed in a traffic accident, and so the, the Krasner Hawkeye hands over to Sam Nola the, the envelope that he was going to give to, to uh, the boss, who's, who's now deceased. And he says it's, it's got the banking codes to a Swiss bank account, um, which contains three million US dollars plus some odds and ends. Mm. Uh, and so Sam has this dilemma because he feels as though he's come, it's as though somebody's giving it, given him the, the, the uh, sort of noir fiction mm. suitcase full of banknotes. What does he do with it, you know? His daughter's quite horrified as well, isn't she? She says, yeah. says You've got, you cannot possibly... Yeah. He, he does haver about it for well, quite, you know, slightly he, too long. What he does is uh, he, he starts to think how... He, he would spend it, $3 million. Mm. And uh, if you've ever done this exercise, think, well, you know, what would you do if you won lotto? And what you tend to do is to think of all the people you... I th I'm sure most people do this. All the people they'd give it to and how much they would give. And he, he's, this is, he's doing this at night. And as the nights pass... He finds three million's not enough, you know. Yeah. So and they did say in some odds and ends, so he pushes the three million up to four. And it's just, still not enough. It's still yeah, not enough. Yeah. It's never going to be enough. Yeah, yeah. And so, of course, eventually, and, and his French daughter, who's very proper about money, as the French are, is just... Yeah, she's a, like a little person yeah. sitting on his shoulder, yes, um, yes. being actually, in some respects, much more grown up than he is. Yes, exactly. Um, yeah. The other thing I love about the book is uh, there's a character in it who's a poet, Tom Rowland, and, mm. and you're also a poet, um, and it seemed right that there was um, this really beautiful description of the creative process that he goes through, which mm. is actually quite dramatic, mm. you know. Um, and I'm wondering whether, I mean, he struggles to produce something that he's happy with and then he wakes feverishly one night and feels that the devil has written this poem and it's practically immaculate and he doesn't... Um, is that how... I mean, I have never written a poem, so yeah. you have to explain what this is. Well, I do, I do have discovered this thing that uh, there are times when it's essential to have a bit of paper and a pen beside your bed because you, you can get an idea for a poem... And you can go over it in your mind and you think, now, I don't need to write this down. I've gone through it so often. 
I'm, I won't forget. And you wake up in the morning and all you have is the sense that you had a wonderful idea in the night, but you, it's gone. You just mm. can't recover it. And so he's in this situation, but Tom Rowland, he, who is himself... Uh, I quite like the character of Tom Rowland. He's English. He's an older man. He's a trader. He's much too old to be still on the trading floor, but there he is. He's still trading away. And... Um, but he's always aspired to be a poet, mm. and he's had some early successes. He's published one little book at his own expense, which he called Floating, and he likes to tell people it sank without trace. <laughs> um, and uh, and he, he's... Uh, well, sh should, is it right I go on about Please, it? Please, yeah. Um, he, uh, he's, he's lost copies of the book, and one of the nice things that Sam does is he, f he discovers a copy of this lost book and gives, it, gives the man back his own book. But anyway, he'd, he's always uh, found it necessary to write poetry and he's unhappy if he doesn't. If mm. He's, mm. So if he has a dry period where there's no poetry coming to his mind, he's very unhappy. But he accepts he's not a successful poet. Mm. But this uh, experience is that it's as if... I mean, he knows in a way that it's not the devil. He calls it Monsieur Le Noir. But the, the devil comes to him or a figure comes to him in the night and gives him half a poem. Mm. And, and he spends a lot of time writing it out and tidying it up and getting it absolutely right. But it's, a, it's only half a poem. And so he's patiently waiting. That happens re reasonably early in the novel. He's patiently waiting for quite a long part, two-thirds of the novel, for the other half. And, and, yeah. he, and eventually, Monsieur Le Noir returns and gives him the other half. But um, he's also very... He's, a, he's an interesting character. He's also involved very dramatically in, in the events of the bombings in 2005. So one part of the poem... Of one part of the novel begins and you think, you know, this character who we've been following... Yeah. Um, has come to a terrible end in a very kind of public known way because yeah. he's um, on the bus that uh, exploded in Tavistock Fair uh, Square. But even after that, he's, he's um, you know, his most, his greatest concern is whether or not he's going to be published in the TLS. Or, yes, that's right. Um, so uh, it's obviously, um, yes. yeah, very interesting. Do you want to read um, anything from... I could, well, I, I could read the poem if read you like. The poem. I could read yeah, the little a bit, bit about it maybe, Tony yeah. Blair yeah. and whichever you... But Tony Blair is good, yeah. Uh, They're both very different, but, you know, it shows the, the breadth of the book. Well, um, should we start with Tony Blair? Or yeah, do you need the... Because you might not to be able to hold the... No, you go ahead, do... I don't know. I, 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 I probably do need a third hand. I'll put this down while I find it. I don't know whether I'm looking for the. I don't know whether I'm looking for the poem or. Um... Well, let's do Tony Blair first. Tony Blair. Yeah. Okay. Um... Sorry, I just have to. You can listen to the music while we're um, finding yeah. the piece in the book. Sorry, this is stupid. I should be. Yeah, I'll This is just after Tony Blair's great success in Washington when he got 19 standing ovations. The Prime Minister in first class plugs in his ears and a mask over his eyes was trying to catch some sleep in the hours between Washington and Tokyo. But excitement kept him awake, going over in his mind his speech to the joint houses. It had been a triumph. He'd been annoyed at first that the, at the White House asking to see the speech in advance and wanting modifications. It meant the stuff about trying to involve Syria and Iran in a resolution to the Iraq question had had to come out, barely a mention, despite the fact that Alistair had alerted the press to expect it. That would have been Cheney getting his oar in. He would have thought it was too conciliatory, and perhaps it was. But then when it came to the speech, it hardly mattered what was in it. With all the jumping up and down they did, one standing ovation after another, there was hardly space to develop an argument. 
And how wonderful to be so appreciated, so loved. Not like at home where your own party turns on you and you have to look to the other bastards for appreciation. He drifted towards sleep, seeing the eager faces, feeling the warm hands reaching out to touch his sleeve. But the warm hand on his sleeve was Alistair's. Sorry to disturb you, Tony. The Prime Minister pulled the mask down and unplugged his ears. What is it, Al? Serious, seriously shitty news from the office. Okay, let's hear it. Walter Mitty's topped himself. You're... No, you're not. Joking? No. Walter Mitty was the name they'd given to the weapons inspector, David Kelly, who had told the BBC they had cooked up the case for going to war. Took himself off to the woods and slit his wrists. Wrist, actually. The bastard so bloodless it took only one. That's tomorrow's front page tone. Your speech will be somewhere inside. He sat up, sighing heavily, and rubbed his hands over his face. What to do? Will you do me a statement, Al? Something I can say when we get off the plane at wherever it is. Tokyo. It's Tokyo tone. Yes, I'll do that. You better get some sleep. You're buggered, aren't you? Don't know that I can. Anything else? Only Manning and Buller, the we've radicalised every young Muslim in Britain dirge. Soothe her down if you can, Al. We don't want her leaking stuff like that. That's the lot? Yes. No, well, there's what? Al put his head close to the PM's ear. N313P. It was the number of the Boeing business jet the CIA used for extraordinary rendition of kidnapped prisoners, sometimes through Britain. There were beginning to be sightings, reports, questions. I don't need to know this, do I? I don't think you do, no. Al straightened up. Like a drink? Cup of tea? Bicky? <laughs> the Prime Minister shook his head and pulled the blanket up over his shoulders. Nothing, thanks, Al. Just write me a few words about Kelly. Nice and neutral, you know. We better sound as if we care. Now, at risk of going from the ridiculous to the sublime, do you want to um, have a go at the poem as well? Okay, yes. We have time. Yeah. Um, the poem. Do you know what page it's on? Oh, 237. This is actually, the complete poem is only read out at Tom Rowland's funeral. Yeah. This is, um, it's called Banking on Feathers. Explains why on the front of the, on the front of the jacket you see feathers. And it's Tom Rowland's poem that the devil brings him. And it's clearly partly about himself and partly about banking. But it's a sort of somewhat obscure poem. He doesn't really know quite what it means. And nor does he know, you know, does the devil exact a price? And if the devil does, what will the price be for this palm? So here it is, banking on feathers. Some toms sing for their supper. One was a piper's son. Some grow old and howl on the heath. This is the story of one. Clever tom who hatched in his head ideas like chickens he sold for bread. Bolt your window, bar your door. This I never told before. That wind against the house wall hurled, cold with the coldness of the world, will shout a moral if it can. This little chicken went to market, this one he kept in his head. Their welfare was Tom's precious care, and his care well fed. Tom's neighbour's coop caught fire, he doused his own with water. Tom's neighbour's wife fell ill, he praised their daughter. And gently, steadily over the scene, the rain fell down and kept it green. Famine was somewhere, somewhere else, two bullets in the head. Far from his care, tall stadiums cast shadows on the dead. But Tom and the land of big ideas grew full of sensitive weathers, counting chickens before they hatched, banking on feathers. A hot rain falls on the rolling earth, in office the dogs obeyed. For men whose brains breed weakling chicks, coops are made. A cold wind blows on the rolling earth, 
Poor Tom's a cold in his brain. The chicken is plucked that sang hi-ho, the wind and the rain. Wonderful, Carl. Thank you so much. And um, huge congratulations on both of these books um, coming out today and next week. And um, if anyone would like to buy a copy, they are being sold at the front desk. Thank you. <laughs>